Well, let me begin um, with a few uh, quotations that will sort of frame, um, to a certain extent, the content of the paper, but also I think will we'll produce the right um, we'll mood uh, for some of the some of the, the ideas that I want to to look at in the paper. Um, the first is actually the recently suicided um, artist Mike Kelly. It's very short. Um, but in an interview, he once said, dead things are art, basically. Um, the next is, is a passage uh, from uh, Marcel Brutthers. And, and in many ways, this paper um, started out as a reading of Brutthers' work. But in the attempt to sort of confront Brutthers, I had to take up his reading of the ready-made and sort of got lost uh, in the logic of the ready-made. So the paper, this year anyways, is basically an a introduction to a reading of Brut there. So I'll maybe hint at a few things um, at the end. I had a few slides but, um, but, uh, of Brut there's work, but since I'm not going to be talking that much about it, um, and mostly just about the ready-made, luckily the ready-made is something that we're probably all familiar with, so slides are not necessary, um, which of course is a danger of uh, you know, philosophy conferences on art is that we're talking about things that we don't care to show, so, and I'll be doing that. Um, but so the, the quote then is, what is art? Ever since the 19th century, the question has been posed incessantly to the artist, to the museum director, to the art lover alike. I doubt, in fact, that it is possible to give a serious definition of art unless we examine the question in terms of a constant. I mean the transformation of art into merchandise. This process is accelerated nowadays to the point where artistic and commercial values have become superimposed. If we are concerned with the phenomenon of reification, then art is a particular representation of the phenomenon, a form of tautology. We could then justify it as, a, as affirmation and at the same time carve out for it a dubious existence. We would then have to consider what such a definition might be worth. One fact is certain, commentaries on art are the result of shifts in the economy. It seems doubtful to us that such commentaries can be described as political. Okay. And the final passage, again, another short one, but uh, it's reported by um, uh, Emilien uh, Carassus, I guess you'd say, um, but it's a book on, on dandyism. And it's the description of, of Gaspar d'Orsay um, who lived from 1801 to 52. Um, I guess at the time he was a sort of infamous French dandy, both in Paris and London, and um, he tried his hand at sculpture, even though I think he was a rather miserable, miserable sculptor. But nonetheless, he had this, there's this wonderful report. A rich financier accidentally dropped a small coin on the ground. When he crouched down to look for it, Dorsay crouched down as well, and to help him better see, lit up a banknote. That's my the first time I've had, a, to, had, had the chance to read that uh, publicly, so I'm very excited. <laughs> it's a wonderful passage. Okay, so let me just begin then. The radicality of the Dadaesque gesture par excellence, the ready-made, consists in its power of abstraction. Its challenge is not to the conventions of a specific medium, but as Duchamp no doubt intended, to the aesthetic as such, that is, to the very question of aesthetic value. And it does so by forcibly collapsing the difference between art and the commodity, aesthetic value and value as such. The ready-made shifts the question of aesthetic judgment, as Thierry de Deuve argues, from the specific, is this or is this not a painting, to the generic, is this or is this not art. The import of this shift does not consist in establishing the existence of art as a general concept to which various arts poetry, music, painting, sculpture, etc., can be referred. But rather, in opening up a practice of the generic as such, right? so what we could now call the post-conceptual sort of consensus of art, artistic practice. An inversion is thus affected in which one is an artist because one is an artist, and not because one paints or sculpts, etc. De Deuve writes, Whereas an abstract painting reduced to a black square on a white background is art only once you accept seeing it as a painting. A urinal is a sculpture only when you accept seeing it 
as art. Otherwise, it simply remains a urinal. The generic seems to precede the specific. At the crux of the ready-made is this problem of what it means then to be an artist in the abstract. Put differently, the artist becomes an artist only by appropriating a split in the art object, which the ready-made foregrounds with a singular clarity, precisely because it forces the encounter between art and the commodity. And it is this encounter with the object, with a split object, that will require the artist in turn to appropriate the split in his or her own subjectivity. And it is the negotiation of these two splits, the split in an object that in turn results in a split in the subject, that orients artistic practice in its move then from the specific to the generic. At least that's my thesis. Although the ready-made has often been read as a quintessentially subjective gesture, and this is sort of the interpretation that, that Nathan laid out a little bit in the introduction that's online, um, that would be Joseph Kosu's say, reading of the ready-made. I think following a suggestive passage in De Duve that it has to be seen as a radicalization of the urge to objectivize the I. It is thus an attempt to objectivate the subject in an object. So here I'm playing with obviously the slippage between the I and um, the, I, the literal I and then the I, and, you know, like that. Um, okay. So it is thus an attempt to objectivate the subject in an object which will in turn reframe the problem of the subject as a problem of how to subjectivate the object. A problem that perhaps only becomes explicit in Marcel Brutther's later Alcine Andersetzung confrontation with the legacy of the ready-made. So Duchamp's respect for Seurat's scientific objectivism and the extreme rigor with which he attempted to mechanize the painterly touch, that is, reduce the hand to being a mere instrument of an eye that records the encounter with light. An eye, as de Duve puts it, quote, already encoded in the ready-made discriminations provided by the paint manufacturer's color charts. Okay, it is this problem, then, of, of how to objectivize the eye and the necessity, then, in, in this attempt to objectivize the eye, to then confront the problem of the industrialization of that eye um, that I think lies at the heart of the ready-made. So then the problem of the ready-made, put differently, concerns a subject that has become an object. Okay, so that's by way of introduction. So let me then just tur turn uh, into, into a more explicit reading of the ready-made. Despite appearances, the ready-made is the least simple of things, and like Marx's treatment of the fetish of commodities, is a thing abounding in metaphysical subtlety. If the ready-made first and foremost has to be recognized as a commodity, this is not because it is merchandise. This is not Duchamp's problem, but that of Marcel Brutter's. It is a commodity then not because it has a price tag, because it has been produced for the purposes of exchange. It is only in their later reproduction and addition, and this irony of course did not escape Marcel Duchamp, that they become commodities, that is to say merchandise in the strict sense. The ready-made is a commodity because it was a commodity, and this temporal gap is established by its appearing as art. This temporal difference entails that the ready-made has a negative relation to the commodity. It was, but no longer is. And yet it is nothing other than that thing that it was. It is not art, this is its challenge, but a commodity. Its sole content consists in being the thing it no longer is. Its appearance as a commodity now serves to negate this relation to the thing that it was. This is the strange temporality of the ready-made. Um, it has to be the thing that it was. The structure of the ready-made is then parasitic on the structure of the commodity itself and reenacts in, in perverted form the drama of its fetishistic character. The peculiarity of the commodity as a measure of value consists in the structural contradiction that obtains between its use and exchange value. As a thing of use, the commodity serves a social purpose, whether real or imagined, and this utility is bound to the array of qualities that it exhibits and that inhere in its matter. And yet these uses are socially distributed 
mediated through acts of exchange that presuppose a quantitative commensuration, their equivalency, and thus the very liquidation in principle of their qualitative character. The dimension of the fetish, the peculiar lure of the commodity, consists in this negation of quality. In losing its qualities, it is as if this loss serves to magnify them. And this is, of course, Benjamin's point um, when, he, when he refers to the, the aura of, of uh, well, the aura of art. So the commodity serves to frame this loss, bestowing the thing with an erratic halo. The whole elaborately complex apparatus of the value form hinges on the formal operation that effects a sleight of hand, a substitution in which things don a mask and appear to be precisely that which they are not, personifying value in and through the negation of their qualities. The commodity lives only by feeding off itself and its brethren, off their qualities, in a movement of perpetual cannibalization. Its, mu its matter is the bearer of an exchange value whose existence requires the negation of the very matter on which it depends. In becoming a commodity, things one could say are gnawed to the bone. And the money form, the null sovereign of exchange, as Marx suggests, is the caput mortem, the deadhead. Money, the commodity of commodities, stripped of its qualities, is the bone in itself. The skeletal remains, as Marx would have it, of living labor. And this lack does not appear as something subtracted, but something added to the commodity, thus giving it a sacred aura that enchants through its very intangibility. And like magic, no matter how many times you see the mechanism of the trick, the miracle of its appearance still enchants, for its allure is inseparable from the performance of the trick itself. As the anonymous structuring background of all social life, capital does not require belief, but engenders it like the magician's performance. As Althusser shows with an insuperable acuity, it is the performance of the ritual that makes one believe. With capital, entry in, into the social symbolic field <clears throat> is no longer a matter of what one believes, but only that one believes. The arch ritual of capital exchange engenders then a peculiar tautology, a belief in belief itself. The mysticism of the commodity, which Marx maintains as structural and therefore in its ineliminable uh, feature, lies in this negative transcendence, something in excess of the commodity's use, namely its exchangeability, appears only in and through that very use. The very appearance of the commodity, its fetishistic character, consists the fact that it appears as that which it is not. Belief is thus a matter of what one does, the rituals one performs, and not what one thinks. And this is obviously one of Marx's um, major points. There is no escaping this ritual, and critique, in my view, is inseparable from the kinds of rituals that one performs, not the exposure of the transparency of the ritual itself. The belief, in other words, just the belief in pricelessness itself not anything in particular, of course, but pricelessness as such is the most pernicious and insidious of ideological beliefs, the ground we could say at the risk of exaggeration of all humanism. Okay. So the claim then that is, is that, that um, no matter how one, no matter how much one criticizes and exposes the fetishistic quality of the commodity, the fetish remains precisely because one exchanges, and it's an absolute necessity. So belief then is produced rather than um, presupposed in order to engage in the relation. Now, in aping this structure but perverting it, the ready-made is at once more and less than the commodity, more insofar as it becomes a second-order reification, a commodity, if you like, that exhibits or performs its own reification. It marks the space of art as the very limit of the commodity form. For the ready-made only works, and it has indisputably worked, and it has indisputably, indisputably worked as magic, insofar as it plays an art's parasitic relationship to belief. 
the ready-made works only if one believes in art, that is, if one believes in its difference, in its autonomy from the mass production of commodities. Paradoxically, it, it also serves to undermine this belief since the belief that the ready-made demands demands the detachment of the ready-made from craft and the specific qualities of a particular medium, undermining, undermining and, and uh, the undermining of the belief in art's qualitative difference engenders a belief then in art in general. So this is a sort of strange paradox that, 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 that I'm looking at. As a belief, art is a social relation and the ready-made exposes art's dependence on a social relation, the relation of judgment which its appearance as art serves to conceal. In this manner, it would appear to render the process of reification transparent in miming its structure, reifying reification itself. This would be the ready-made's putative function of disenchantment. Although the ready-made is often interpreted quite legitimately as a critique of the claims of artistic autonomy, the separation of art and life, it functions only insofar as it reproduces the conditions of the separation in the same moment that it negates them. The ready-made thus plays a double role with respect to art. In playing this double role, playing both sides, in playing art off the commodity and the commodity off of art, it is at once disenchanting, as I just showed, but I think more importantly it is also enchanting. So both a negation of art, but, as is proved in its effective history, an expansion of its field. This is the essential ambivalence of the ready-made and its insuperable challenge. And so I think this challenge has been taken up in, in two central ways. The first is, 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 I think, I mean, for what it's worth, I think a more faithful reading of Duchamp, let's say, of his own account of the ready-made, but it's probably the less, uh, the less familiar, anyways, at least it was, well, it's less familiar to me um, when I was writing it. Um, so the challenge can be interpreted then in a, dan in a dandiesque or a stoic manner. And Duchamp in 1913, during his time as an assistant at the uh, Bibliothèque Sainte Genevieve, avidly read Piro, um, the stoic. And in this reading, the ready-made is neither aesthetic nor a non-aesthetic, but inculcates an indifference to aesthetic value. At least this was Duchamp's hope in making indifference the very criteria of the selection of a ready-made. It seeks to suspend right, the stoic epoche, the operations of aesthetic judgment, engendering a kind of neutrality and cultivating an indifference to the very problem of the difference between art and life, as the stoic Pierrot claimed indifference to being alive or dead. The separation effected by the object, the ready-made, its vertiginous status between art and life serves to separate the subject from him or herself. In being selected and not made by the artist, the relationship between the eye and the hand is severed. So the touch of the artist, in other words. The problem of art, and, 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 so, to, and, and so that it's, it serves to separate the eye and the hand, but the object is chosen un, uh, under the criterion of indifference. So Zen is precisely an attempt to neutralize uh, the eye's aesthetic judgment. So Duchamp, and Duchamp defines, uh, so the problem of art uh, shifts from technique as its focal concern to wit or genius. And Duchamp defines genius as uh, l'impossibilité, uh, sorry, sorry for my French, uh, l'impossibilité du faire. So, um, it, it, and the fer is F-E-R, so it's the impossibility of iron, but it also then has this sort of double entendre of the impossibility of making. However, the other reading, the, the, cha the, other, the other challenge of the ready-made can be interpreted, it has been, can be, the challenge, sorry, can be interpreted more violently. The ready-made in this case becomes paradigmatic of an anti-art gesture on par with the surrealist enchantment with firing a gun into a crowd. The ready-made then stands for abolishing the sphere of art, challenging its pretensions to autonomy, and exposing the institutional conditions that frame and legitimate art practice. The ready-made then sets in motion a singular power of negation, 
focusing art's critical powers on its capacity to expose how the institution of art as an autonomous sphere is made possible through the exclusion of forms of non-art. The ready-mades the ready-made subsequent inclusion within art, its institutionalization on this reading, then stands for art's apparently unlimited capacity to reify the difference between art and non-art. Staged on this very difference, its power is thus seen as one of disenchantment in which the artwork's parasitic relationship on its former cult status uh, still... Okay, sorry, this is a butchered sentence. Um, Okay, so staged on this, on this very difference, its power is thus seen as one of disenchantment in which the artwork's parasitic relationship on his former cult status still animating the tendency towards painterly abstraction, for example, Kandinsky's quite explicit spiritualization of color, is itself challenged. And the failure then of this challenge, right, namely its recuperation by the institution of art then always stands as, as, a, as, a, as a symbol of the impotence of the critical gesture of the ready-made. And so the ready-made thus has to be overcome, and it's overcome through finding ever further spheres of non-art that can be reintroduced into art precisely in order to dislodge the concept of art. So this would be the kind of standard dialectic of the avant-garde. In staging itself, and I don't know if I make it clear, but I'll do it right now. In many ways, I'm, I, I side, I'm going to be emphasizing more the Duchampian reading, eventually sort of offering a third account um, that, would be differ, that will differ from either this Duchampian reading of indifference, let's say, um, the stoic Dandiesque version, and the... Uh, and, and, and on the other hand, this other uh, more, well, seeing it as, a, as seeing the purely negative function of the, of the ready-made. I'm going to be differentiating myself from both of those, but I side more with, with the first one. So in staging itself on the gap, and I think both of these accounts share this, in staging itself on the gap between art and non-art, its power of abstraction, the ready-made's power of abstraction, consists in separating the artwork from itself. So this is when I, at the beginning when I talked about the object being separated from itself. This is an account of that. So it, dis dis it disidentifying its appearance from what it is. So a ready-made is not the thing that we recognize. A urinal, a hat rack, a shovel, a comb, etc. And thereby separating thought from its object. So the, 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 I guess the, the peculiar thing is to think this contradiction. Why it is that on the one hand the ready-made is not the thing that it appears to be but at the same time, it's not the thing that it appears to be only because it is the thing that it appears to be. Right. <clears throat> it allows for, and in doing so, in, in opening up this gap, it allows for a new conjunction between thought and the sensible, between appearance and how we recognize what appears. That is how we name what appears. The sensible, in not coinciding with itself, allows thought to not in turn to not coincide with, its, with itself, namely with its object. The name serves as a locus of this disjunction, breaking the link between the object and its signifier. Right? So you have a shovel and it's named in advance of a broken arm. Or you have a urinal and it's named fountain, for example. The ready-made is art only insofar as it relates to that which it is not a mere commodity. And yet this relation is not a thing with qualities that could be used as one encounters commodities in the marketplace. It is to repeat at once more or less than a commodity. So we can say then that the ready-made, and this is maybe a bit of a leap, but I, I still want to make it, the ready-made is the bone of culture, an interpretation that will not um, escape Marcel Brut there. So some of you might be familiar with the, with the femur bones that he presented that, that, were, that were painted with the colors of the, of the French flag, or more famously, that of the Belgian flag. This allusion to Hegel, namely to the, to the bone of culture, this allusion to Hegel is apt precisely because the ready-made 
can stand in for art, serving this uh, metonymical function only by being identified absolutely with what it is not. The ready-made as art is, and again, returning then to this, to this title, caput mortem. The bone is that most problematic of elements for Hegel, whose being in itself signifies nothing for consciousness. It's sheer indifference to the dialectic of life and death. In life and in, in, life and in death, the bone remains the same, utterly neutral, offers no image with which consciousness can identify. To pass off bone, as Hegel puts it, as the actual existence of consciousness, quote, must be regarded as a complete denial of reason. And Hegel would no doubt judge those who judge the ready-made to express the reality of art as harshly as those who regard the bone as their reality, that is, the phrenologists. For this, Hegel reserves perhaps the most violent passage in the whole of his corpus. So let me, let me read this. Um, to reply to... <laughs> To reply to such a judgment with a box on the ear, as in the case of a similar judgment in physiognomy mentioned above, at first takes away from the soft parts their importance and position, and proves only that these are no true in itself, uh, and, and proves only that, they're, uh, that these are no true in itself, are not the reality of spirit. The retort here would, strictly speaking, have to go the length of beating in the skull of anyone making such a judgment in order to demonstrate in a manner just as palpable as his wisdom that for a man a bone is nothing in itself, much less his true reality. Okay, so you have to beat in the skull. So to those who deny reason to such a degree that the logos itself no longer has any force, one must resort to the fist or perhaps the club to prove one's point, acting as barbarically as the mind that one is confronting. And yet Duchamp's greatness lies in forcing this very convergence that entails the complete inconsistency of thought with itself. So, yeah, okay. Duchamp plays with, and by the way, I mean, if I'm reaching any sort of time limit, just, just uh, give me some indication. Uh, Duchamp plays with and on the great fear summoned by the metaphysician, namely that of indifference. <clears throat> that in this confrontation with, with inconsistency, the minimal difference that thought requires, so in the artistic concept, uh, context, the difference between art and non-art, that thought requires to distinguish itself will vanish, plunging it into an undifferentiated abyss. And Jean, and, and Jean Pauhan identified this most Empedoclean of inclinations with what he called the terror, the desire of an artist for a sign that would be its own sense, since the sign itself reintroduces the gap through its referential structure that allows for its signification, its very function as a sign, the terrorist ends up destroying signification in the name of signification, that is, in the name of pure meaning. The preservation of sense coincides with its abolition, lacking any measure to moderate the difference between the sense and nonsense of art the only evidence of art, real art, consists in its repeated destruction. And that, again, I guess, would be this, this dialectic of the avant-garde. As Agamben writes, quote, the dream of the terror is to create works that are in the world in the same way as the block of stone or the drop of water. It is the dream of a product that exists according to the statute of a thing, of the thing. However, the ready-made proceeds in an inverse manner. Rather than, rather than a collapse of the distinction, art and non-art, it enforces a separation, you could say, between the sign and the signified, as if to exacerbate the difference between the product and the, and the thing in the product itself. So here what I'm claiming is that, is that, the, the, that in appearing as a commodity but in the context of art, it affects a separation in the product itself between its commodity status and its thingly status. The ready-made could perhaps be said to mark a tendency in the object to resist its own instrumentality. It is the objects, and this is, I think, this is a concept dear to, uh, dear to Evan, um, for those of you actually, I've never actually, I didn't hear the paper in the comedy, but, but this, the, 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 I mean, I'm taking up what I imagine you wrote, at least 
I hope. <laughs> I hope you wrote. <laughs> Just, you know, since I can, I can probably feel it through, through friendship, let's say. It is the, uh, the object's hostility to the system of ends um, that can be read in Granville's illustrations. And Agamben sort of takes this up. And it's precisely, so Granville's illustrations famously, or he has one of the, at least one of the more famous ones, is it has a figure trying to put on a long boot. And is the boots being designed, obviously, in a way that makes it almost impossible to get your foot into. So in this struggle, you know, you, the boot ends up resist, resisting its use. So it is the object's hostility to the system of ends um, that can be read in Granville's illustrations. And it's precisely this interpretation of the object countering its own commodification that informs his reading, namely Agamben's reading, of the dandy of dandies, Beau Brummel. So now I'm going to sort of shift. Hopefully this doesn't seem too, too much of a leap. But I want to shift then from this idea of an object that resists itself to the dandy's relationship to the object. And this will occasion then a reading of, of the ready-made that on the one hand has this tendency to want to identify this gap in the object between, let's say, the, itself as a product and itself um, as, a, as a thing, and how this then in turn requires a response of the subject to appropriate this gap. And so I think the dandy in this sense is an interesting uh, figure who confronts this problem, obviously, not in the art context, but in, let's say, in a social context. So the materiality of the object does not resist through its use, but in its frustration of, re of use. Precisely as the human attempts to seize upon the commodity's use, the object rebels against the intention for which it has been crafted. Precisely in the moment of possession, the object dispossesses the owner. Duchamp often referred to the encounter with the ready-made as a rendezvous. It is at once deeply personal and sing a singular encounter of a singular life, but it serves to open the person to the impersonal, which can be seized only through the appropriation of this encounter itself. So can, in other words, the object has to be equal to the encounter with the object. That would be the, the Duchampian criterion for a selection of a ready-made. So it dispossesses the owner of ownership, the object dispossesses the owner of ownership, and at the same time forces the owner to lay claim to the impersonal. It forces upon the subject the task of impersonation. So the claim then that I'm going to be making is, is that, like the dandy, what the ready-made forces one to do is, or what, what, what Duchamp is doing with the, with the problem of the, of the ready-made is could be seeing the artist as the impersonator of objects. In rupturing the relation between the hand and the work, the artist nevertheless remains its author. But as its author, the artist relates to it as the Hobbesian sovereign relates to the subjects he impersonates. The author is now the impersonation of the object. So in that sense is how I'm understanding the idea of impersonation. Duchamp's eminent dandyism consists in translating what a figure like Beau Brummel already accomplished within the social field into the sphere of art proper. Now the dandy already foreshadows the separation of the subject from its, co um, from its co uh, commitment to use, to utility, to the hand. Countering the bourgeois stratification of labor, of work, the dandy seeks to separate himself from labor and its usefulness for the market. A dandy becomes a being that is essentially useless, trivial, unproductive, reducing his self to the status of a mere thing to be ornamented. He becomes an object to himself in the same way that he is an object for others, living out his life, as Baudelaire put it, in front of a mirror. The dandy thus appropriates the process of reification itself, identifying himself with the empty shell of the surface, treating the world as an egg divested of its living potential. To quote Agamben, the dandy uh, must become a living corpse, constantly tending towards an other, a creature essentially non-human and anti-human. So we can say then that the dandy is a spiritual automaton, striving to eliminate intentionality as the core determinant 
of his or her subjectivity. So in doing so, the dandy places his or herself, but historically his self, at the disposal of contingency. And Agamemnon goes so far as crediting the dandy with the intro introduction of chance into the artwork, referencing Beau Brummel's infamous folds in his cravat. And this is a quote, in the abolition of any trace of subjectivity from his own person, no one has ever reached the radicalism of Beau Brummel. With an asceticism that equals the most mortifying of mystical techniques, he constantly cancels from himself any trace of personality. This is the extreme serious sense of a number of his witticisms, such as Robinson, this is Beau Brummel's manservant, Robinson, which of the lakes do I prefer? Um, so dandyism, using the terms with which André Breton described Jacques Fache, is always a matter of desertion from within. So how can one impersonate one's personality? And, that's, and one does that precisely by treating the personality as an object like any other object, as a thing among things. The gap in the object and that I've been tr trying to point out in the ready-made has to be sustained by a reciprocal gap in the subject. And only by inhabiting this gap does the artist appropriate her own in inaptitude, what is often to be re uh, referred to as the de-skilling uh, of the artist. So this separation of the eye and the hand, in other words, as I put earlier. We can now see how the success of the ready-made depends upon a simultaneous inflation and deflation of the artist. An art that consists in the negation of its own quality can be sustained only by a subject that separates herself or himself from its capacity to create, to make. So art touches upon its real to the same extent that the subject withdraws. And the ready-made shifts the scene then from the work itself to the drama of the subject's withdrawal, its self-dissolution. A drama initially marked by Duchamp's own infamous withdrawal from the art world and the myth real and fictional of his chess playing. Paradoxically, the very exclusion of the artist's hand from the work has the inverse effect of implicating her artistic subjectivity, the life, namely the life of the artist. The artist can no longer be excluded from the work, not because she is the maker, but because she is its necessary effect. So this is, going, this is sort of the, the claim that I'm making. So now the subject returns not as author, as preceding the work, but precisely as an effect of the work itself. The author function is a product just as much as the work. And here we can think not only of Duchamp's own sort of uh, assumption of the persona of Rose Salave, or the aloofness of Warhol, but also the shamanistic practice of Joseph Boys or the self-travestying of Martin Kippenberger. To borrow the title of the text by Diedrich, uh, Diedrichsen on Kippenberger, the artist then um, implicated by the work becomes a Selbstdarsteller. So in, in German it sounds better, in English I don't know, a, a self-presenter or something, but it sounds idiotic and it sounds silly anyways. The ready-made, then cipher, does it sound fine? Okay, so, okay fine, self-presenter. Doesn't seem to have, maybe it's just the, German. yeah, the German is, uh, is more, is more like a fist, um, like all German things, I guess. The, uh, the ready-made cipher is an extreme contradiction. It is at once the result of an excessive asceticism with respect to artistic sensibility, the artist's sensitivity for materials, for example, the painter's fetishization of color, the smell of paint, what Duchamp often referred to as olfactory masturbation. Right? So you, you refer to the painter as engaging in olfactory masturbation. Um, the artist must separate herself from the practice that defines him or her. And it is precisely, however, this separation that Duchamp already saw, for example, in the work of, uh, of Seurat that I mentioned in the beginning. And yet, this separation of the hand of the artist, the artist as a specific technician, so separating it from the, this idea of technique, engenders an absolutization of the artistic subject as the subject that selects. The denial of the subject results in its inflation. And the ready-made marks then a new relation of the subject, uh, 
the ready-made marks then uh, a new problem, namely the relation of the subject to things in which the thing inhabits a neutral space where the task is not one of supersession, as has been now, um, which has been the now classical narrative of the avant-garde's dialectic between transgression and recuperation, but one of neutralization. Right? So that, in other words, what I'm claiming here is that, the, the that Duchamp's initial answer to the problem of neutralization is not the overcoming of art, but rather the investment of this new problem of the subject. Now, if, um, so I'll approach a conclusion here. Like last year, I'm going to have a problem concluding. I feel like I always have a problem concluding. Um, but anyways, I'll, I'll conclude nonetheless. If uh, Duchamp pursues the ready-made for the sake of aesthetic, uh, uh, for the sake of aesthetic of neutralization, of an aesthetic, sorry, of neutralization, um, that seeks to neutralize the aesthetic, I think the importance of Marcel Bruter's lies in marking a third option that neither follows a model of, of neutralization nor that of the model of critical, uh, critical transgression. And it's a model that I'm tempted to call that of, of substitution. The suppression of the subject cannot do, in other words, without a fiction of the subject. And it is with this fiction that Marcel Bruter's art begins. Put, put differently, Bruter's work begins with thinking how the ready-made itself suppresses its own fictional dimension. Put otherwise, Bruter is often sort of referred to how the problem with the ready-made is that it suppresses its own aestheticizing function. So that it, it sort of separates itself from, from the aesthetic or at least it purports to, but it doesn't necessarily think how that very separation results in a, in a different, in a renewed aestheticization. And so it's precisely this renewed aestheticization that Bruteres wants to, to deal with. Um, so it'd be, in other words, and this is why Bruteres is also often read as, as one of the sort of most melancholic uh, figures, precisely because he's often seen as the figure that's constantly sort of pointing out the pretensions of the avant-garde and the failure of the avant-garde precisely to um, m uh, make good on their critical claims. And what I'm, what, I, what I'm more interested in is the way in which Bruteres sees that this not making good is not, does not become um, the seat for a kind of meditation or obsession with, with a kind of melancholic loss of the critical potential of art but rather becomes precisely the productive function of art itself. But it does so only if, in fact, the artist constantly takes up this problem of fiction. That's not only the question of the fictionalization of the object, but the fictionalization of the subject. And so Bruteres famously, he was sort of lived, I mean, he was basically a poet for most of his life. Um, he always saw poetry as his chief vocation, but he gave it up in, in um, when he, at the age of 40. And that throughout the, his rather short career, I think he died in, in the mid-70s, in the mid 76 maybe, or 77, I can't remember. Um, but he had this very short, intensive um, production. Um, but throughout, in almost all of his interviews, Bruteres constantly um, returns to the myth of his own becoming an artist. So this is kind of what, what, at the beginning, when I talked about this distinction in reference to De Duve between the specific and the generic, what I'm interested in is the way in which Bruteres takes up this problem of the artist becoming generic. And so that he constantly has to remythologize his own departure or abandonment of, of, of poetry. So departure from a specific art um, to a general art. And he, he always then basically also, frames that as, as the artist having to assume the cloak, so to speak, of the commodity. So let me then begin. He has a number of these myths. Um, a lot of them are really interesting. Um, but let me just begin with one of the more famous ones, which is, uh, the, which is the text that um, he, he used as the sort of marketing device of his first um, exhibition. Um, and this was in, I think, 66 or 67. And 
on the cards which he'd printed on, on um, advertisements that had been taken out of uh, like fashion magazines as well as other types of um, magazines chiefly used to basically sell commodities. He had this as his sort of initial announcement of his, his artistic career. I too wondered, so this is Marcel uh, Berthers, I too wondered if I couldn't sell something and, and succeed in life. For quite a whole, uh, for quite a whole, I had, uh, for quite a long time, I had been good for nothing. I am four years old. The idea of inventing something insincere finally crossed my mind, and I set to work at once. At the end of three months, I showed that I had produced what I had produced to Philip Edouard Toussaint, the owner of the Gallery Saint Laurent. But it is art, he said, and I will, uh, I will gladly exhibit all of it. Agreed, I replied. If I sell something, he takes 30%. It seems these are the usual conditions. Some galleries take 75%. What is it? It's in fact a few objects. Okay, so that's, that's how he introduced his, his career of becoming an artist, which he wanted to say is a question of becoming insincere. Um, so maybe let me just, I'll end with that, um, with that passage. And um, yeah, okay, I'll end there, <laughs> thanks.